I'm all for changing your opinion when you're preve- you know, presented with new information. It's changing your opinion based on what you believe is public opinion. That yep. is the big mistake to make. Yeah, you start to lose, you start to lose yourself. And, and that's, then, when you're, that's when you're building an avatar. Mm-hmm. You're, you're responding with what people want to hear. And, and you, know, you do that long enough for a couple of years, you're going to get to a point in your life when something really you know, traumatic is going to happen and you need yourself to fall back on and you don't know who that person is. Yeah. And you're not ready and you're not, you haven't been putting in the work to actually support yourself through it. Kyle Creek goes by the online moniker, The Captain. And I was initially drawn to having a conversation with him because he just seems like one of those guys that's willing to talk about anything and talk about it vulnerably. And so this is one of those podcasts where him and I just go into any topic that's on our hearts and minds, covering a wide range of things from parenthood to vulnerability. And it's just a great conversation with a really good guy. And you get to have an even deeper insight into myself and into Kyle and into what's underneath this idea, this veneer of the captain and why he decided to come out as Kyle Creek. He's also a prolific author, published many different books, and it's just a great conversation. So enjoy this podcast with Kyle Creek. The truth is, is that we're all the master. We're all the healer. We're all the mystic. Give it up one time for Aubrey Marcus. The coolest thing about Maine Coons, if you see those big gray ones, they look like a wizard that would quiz you to cross a bridge. <laughs> like if you were walking and you were on a trek uh-huh. and a, something had to ask you three questions, it would be a gray Maine Coon. Dude, just take enough mushrooms. That's what I'm saying. And that's talk a, to your Maine Coon and see, maybe, understand maybe, that, maybe that's what's going to happen. Understand maybe that's what's going to happen universe. to me. We, we just started this podcast. Podcast is rolling. You were oh. explaining one thing that I think is, is worth talking about. We're talking about pets. Yeah. And I just popped open your book and I found this thing about death of a pet and it's uh speech therapy 52 pick-me-ups to get you through many of life's what the fucks i actually just helped bury my sister's boxer and uh and so that got us on the conversation i want to talk about that but first i want to talk about you being a revised cat hater you're moving from cat hating to a new more evolved it's a, it's a it's a more mature self for sure <laughs> um yeah, I mean, growing up, I was always very anti-cat. And then in 2019, I had a real depressive spell, and my girlfriend had a cat at the time. And I had never had an animal be there for me like that cat was. Like, that cat was just always on my lap, and it could just sense when I wasn't feeling right, and it would come lay on my chest, or I'd be in mm. bed at night, and I'd wake up, and the cat would be sleeping on me, or it'd be nestling up in my beard. And before that, I had I had a complete you know, I was reviled by cats. What, what, what is it? Cause that's something that you find in men, particularly sometimes some women. I think it's mostly men. I think it's cause it's easy. I think because as a man, you feel like you need to have a rebellious spirit around you. And it's easy to pick on something like a cat because there are, they're very polarizing. And so if you want to come across as someone who has a like, oh, I'm very steadfast in my beliefs. You can't change them. It's easy to be like, oh, fuck cats. Um, <laughs> so it defines a certain aspect of your identity? It does. I have another theory. My theory is, is that most men are frustrated by their longing and desire to be loved by the feminine. Mm-hmm. Like we all have those people, especially when you're going to school, right? Like you're a freshman and there's a freshman girl in your class and you fucking really are into her, but she's into the junior Mm-hmm. Or the or the saw or somebody a little older and like you you're always a little frustrated, you know whether it's freshman in high school or freshman in fucking college. There's this like frustration that you love something but they won't like return that love, something beautiful, mm-hmm. and it won't return that love. And cats can have that spirit where it sounds like your cat was very loving and probably re- revised mean, that. But it's like it's like I love you. Why don't you love me? And the cat's like I don't fucking care. Well, that's I'm out of here. That's one of the things I admire about cats now is you have exactly. to re- you have to earn their affection. Exactly. And even then they'll be very selective with it. <laughs> so it makes you appreciate when the cat does. It's like everyone says, you know, you go to a party and the dog chooses you like you feel like you're the chosen one in the uh-huh. room. If a cat will choose you, that's a next level of attraction in and your then life. it's like then it's like the goddess chose you then it's mm-hmm. like then it's like finally the woman chose you and so it can, you can reverse that and if you like if you're interested in getting love from something that isn't so easy that's actually the exact reason why I love cats so much mm-hmm. is because it's like 
wow, this feels special. You know, this feels special when like either Cyrano or Neytiri, one of my two cats, like comes up and nestles between me and I'm like, my energy must be real good today. I could see that. <laughs> you know yeah, I, I mean? could see that. And I think, I think there probably is something to what you're saying for sure. I think a lot of people don't want to put in the work to be liked by a cat. Yeah. Whereas a dog, if you feed it and you're fairly affectionate, the dog's going to love you, which also has its upsides. Um, but it's kind of what we talked about before this. People don't want to put in work these days to have a reward. A lot of people want things that just come easy to them. And you right. actually have to work to develop a bond with a cat. I remember my, you know, my ex-partner had an Alaskan clique high named Lobi, and it was pretty special. Every morning I would wake up and it would, Lobi would always wait for me to wake up. So I would actually be awake, wouldn't wake me up, and then would just start relentlessly licking my neck. Yeah. And it was like just a little love bomb every single morning. And the consistency of that was actually like really cool too. So I wish my, I, see, I I wish my dog sides. would wait. My dog won't wait until I'm awake. Like if I don't shut the <laughs> bedroom, that would be if I don't shut ruthless. the bedroom door, and he's a great Dan too. If I don't shut the bedroom door, he'll come in and he'll start nuzzling me with his nose. And he's a big <laughs> dog. He can push me out of the bed. He'll he, he'll just push me until I get up. Um, so we have to remember to always shut the door, and then he'll start kind of pawing at the door when he wants uh-huh. to go out. But um, I think that's why you got to have both. I think that's why you need a dog and a cat in your life. I'm a, I'm I think a it's the balance both, for yeah. sure. Uh, so yeah, recently buried, uh, helped to bury my sister's boxer and I wasn't particularly close, but Mm. with that, with that animal, but you know, through my sister, of course, I wanted to be there. And one of the things that I've realized is that there's a lot missing from rituals around death and like how to actually deal with it. Rituals around birth, rituals Mm -hmm. around marriage. I think everything needs a good, healthy revision, but around death, it's something that I've seen that's like. I think we're really missing a lot and i so i tried to like offer that in that experience but i haven't had a chance to read because i just opened up your book to check out that spot like what are your what are your ideas and what are your thoughts on uh, on death of a pet and then i'll i'll add my own so, to it as well that book the way it's written is the premise of we're all going to have these things happen in our life and no matter how emotionally equipped or prepared we think we are there's things that are going to derail us um it can be something as simple as you know losing your keys That'll drive me nuts. I can be in a good mood. I can lose my keys. And and 10 (laughs) minutes later, I'm in a horrible fucking mood. Uh And if I don't quickly get myself out of that, I can derail my day. Mm. And so that was the premise of the book. What's the self-talk that happens when you lose your keys? What do you start saying to yourself? I think I'm a fucking idiot. (laughs) I start questioning myself, say, where did you put it? Why can't you remember this? Why Mm. are you, you know, why are you this stupid kind of thing? And that's Mm -hmm. a lot of the negative self-talk that, you know, too many of us have, unfortunately. And so it's that kind of self-talk that'll drive me crazy when it comes to to something as small as that. And then when it came to something as large as the death of a pet, um, what I wanted to do in that book is lend my perspective from it. Mm-hmm. And when my dog died, which the dog that inspired that actually was a boxer too, um, it was the first animal that I'd really bonded with. I'd never had that connection. I grew up on a, you know, I grew up on a farm. We had like chickens and stuff like that, but you don't bond with them the way you do a dog. No. And when he died, I remember my mom saying to me, this is a chance to thank him. Like yeah. thank him for what he was in your life. And that really changed the way I looked at it. And I started interpreting that. And later I had a friend who had a dog die as well. And she was kind of telling me the same stuff I remember feeling. And I told her, I said, what you got to keep in mind is who you were with that dog, what that dog taught you. That dog allowed you to be a version of yourself you likely aren't with people because you know that dog's not going to judge you. And that's why people will baby talk their animals and they act totally different around their pets because they feel comfortable with them. Mm -hmm. And I told her, I said, it's a time to thank your dog for allowing that side of you to come out. And then as you move forward, just try and keep that mindset of being that with people, you know, being who you were with your dog with people. You may not, Mm -hmm. you don't have to baby talk or any stuff like that, but that version of yourself that wasn't afraid to be judged or wasn't afraid to show affection and that is what i think pets do for us and that's why i think it's important that people are raised with pets i mean my son right now we have two cats and a dog and watching him interact with the pets is probably my most rewarding um part of being a dad yeah i like seeing that bond they have at such a young age like my dog's a big dog and he knows my son's a baby he knows to be gentle with him the way the way he roughhouses with the cats and the way he roughhouses with my son are completely different. Mm-hmm. He knows my son can't roughhouse the way the cats can. He can't push them off the couch. And, you know, he'll push the cats off the couch. He can't do that with my baby. But mm-hmm. seeing a dog do that, it just opens up your eyes to the fact that 
Animals, I think, are more intelligent than we give them credit for. For sure. And it's can- Intelligent in a different way. You know, yeah. like we, we quantify our intelligence in certain particular ways of speech patterns and intellectual mm -hmm. capacity, but the ability to read energy, you know, most of us are absolute idiots yeah. when it comes to that, whereas animals are fucking experts. And I had someone tell me that. that about cats. They say, have you seen the reason why a cat will be chilling and suddenly just take off? It's because they can feel the energy in a room unlike anything else can. And yeah. so the reason cats are so spastic, which is what turns people off to them, is they're reading stuff in the room that we can't. Yeah. And had you told me that prior to 2019, I would have told you you were a fucking idiot. Yeah. Um, but now, as we talked about, once I opened myself up to this more energetic, connective way of living, I can completely understand why cats would be like that. Yeah. It's one thing I, I notice about the way that people can interact with pets is there's so much judgment that prevents us from any type of approximation of unconditional love with mm -hmm. each other, especially an adult, you know, like they're, we feel that they're culpable and responsible for every decision they make, every flaw they have. And to some degree, yes, we do have choice and we do have agency, and we, but there's so much judgment that comes as somebody gets older. And we see that with kids as well. Like the way that it's actually, it's an, it's an abomination when you see parents like overly, you know, castigating and punishing like a three-year-old mm -hmm. or a four-year-old, like, what the fuck are you doing? That's a child. Yeah. You know, and so like the more sentient of us realize that, but at a certain point, our boy's like 10 and they do something and then it's like, how dare you? How can yeah, you fucking you, do this? You have so much judgment. And you tell them you should know better by now or, it's, you know, you, you're, exactly, you're exactly. a big boy now and you use that kind of terminology that yeah. I think just create shame in their life. Of course. And with pets, you know, you can still have some of that, but even with, you see it even with like the difference between a puppy and a dog, like mm. if the dog's been trained and they do something, then you can get real mad at them. Yeah. But the beauty of it is that ultimately, if you remember they're a dog, it always allows you to actually love them a lot more unconditionally. Like, ah, oh, fuck, you're just a dog. And if we could actually learn that with humans too, like, ah, oh, fuck, you're just a human. You know Absolutely. what I mean? It would like soften some of this sharp, some of the sharp edges of our judgment. And I think uh, I had a buddy of mine who was very successful in life and he ended up moving um, to Montana to kind of go off the grid for a bit. And he fell into like a lot of deep depression and he got stuck in kind of his old ways. Like I would, I would say like an old man would, but he was still, you know, young and in his thirties. And one of the things I told him, I said, you need to get a dog. Like yeah. you need a dog up there because for one, you need the companionship, but two, you need something that'll fuck your days up. You need, you need, <laughs> yeah. you need something that'll show you you can't control everything. Um, I tell this story before. I mean, my great Dane one night ate a bunch of avocados out of the avocado tree in the backyard, and in the Skin middle, of the, and all, yeah, everything. He's gonna shit himself in the middle of the night in the guest room. A hundred and sixty pound dog has violent diarrhea, <laughs> and I woke up the next morning. And I walked in and I was like, what? the fuck just happened in here it looked like someone had tried to paint the room <laughs> and i felt bad for him i wasn't yeah, mad yeah, i was yeah. like damn like how did i not pay attention to that for you and he was covered in himself and that completely derailed my day of course i had to go rent a carpet shampoo and it spent me all day <laughs> and then i had to rent another one like a second or third time and i'm honestly glad it happened because every day that i wake up my dog hasn't done that it's easy it's an easy day right. now like when you have things like that, they kind of recalibrate what you consider an easy day or a hard day. Hmm. And so I told my buddy, I was like, you need a pet. Like you need something that will, you know, chew on your phone cord. You need something that's going to knock something over when you think you put it perfectly there because, and I believe a lot of cause of depression, um, particularly with people, you know, that kind of isolate themselves like that is they try to control everything. And when you do that, you feel like the world doesn't understand you or mm -hmm. you feel like uh well it's i think one of the signatures of depression is hopelessness and mm -hmm. if you're trying to control everything that's a fucking hopeless cause exactly you are in the the epitome of hopelessness at that point because you got no fucking chance mm -hmm. the world is gonna the world is gonna do what the world is gonna do and so there's just so much benefit to having pets for just a v yeah. various reasons i think yeah i agree so to just close the loop on the on the burying a pet for me i think gratitude is absolutely right so i had my sister and my niece and my nephew and my other sister and my mom and my stepdad and we're burying it out on a ranch and you know, so I brought some tobacco and, and you know, traditional hmm. Amazonian culture and a lot of other cultures. Tobacco is called a chakaruna. It's a bridge. 
So we had some tobacco leaf in our hand and we sprinkled it over the, over Kiro the dog. And as they did it, I had everybody talk about their favorite memory of, of Kiro in an act of gratitude. And it was really emotional just to hear everybody express like what they loved and an experience that they really loved about it. And it was a celebration of the relationships that were formed. And even me, who didn't have a strong relationship, like I remember at the, at the dog's, the end of his days, he was he had dementia and he couldn't control his bowels and it was his time. It was mm. an old boxer, 14 years old. But his fight to love life and to go, like if we were going walking, even though his hips didn't work right, he would be like clawing and he'd get himself up and he'd have bright eyes and just if we could all love life, just a fraction of how much that that dog showed us that he loved life and how excited he was just for the simplicity of going on a walk. Mm. Like if we could learn that, like that lesson, you know, that lesson we could carry with us forever. So in that gratitude, it was able to really help kind of close the loop of like a deep appreciation. And I think that's an element of grief that we, kind of overlook like we think grief is just about being sad and i think part of the funeral rites of anything should be an absolute fucking celebration mm-hmm. and yes cry the tears and wail the sing the songs and 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 wail into the night do whatever else you want to do but also celebrate like celebrate the life that was i think what's a cool thing about your story too is if you were to eavesdrop on that and didn't know it was a dog people were talking about i'm sure a lot of yeah. the the bonds that were formed you would think it was an individual person totally um and that just goes to show you that when, like you're saying, when, you, when you're open to connecting with a, an animal, it's very possible to have a relationship that can, you know, be just as close as a human to human one. Yeah. You've referenced uh, a period of depression that you had in 2019. Let's go into the dark days. Let's, Let's go do into it. Those, I'm, I'm more than happy moment. to talk about it. It's something I've actually, you know, told myself I would talk about often. Yeah. Um, so for those of you that don't know or people listening that don't know who I am, uh, I had this persona online for a long time as the captain and it started as something that I created to separate my personal life from my professional life. Uh, at the time I was working in advertising, I had a lot of clientele I didn't want to lose for, you know, fear of saying something or tweeting something or writing something they would find off color. Um, because a lot of what I write is very, you know, on the nose and I, I un- unapologetic in my, my opinions. And in having that character for so long and maintaining that character and starting to become known as that character. Um, for, you know, for example, when you go out and people start referring to you as the captain, like if someone recognizes you mm-hmm. at a coffee shop, they don't call you Kyle, you know, they call me the captain. And I thought it was cool at first. I was like, oh, this is yeah. awesome. Like people are recognizing me. Um, captain, and then, captain. And then after a <laughs> while, you start to feel really almost sickened by it. Sure. And you start to question who you are as a person more and more, like what is happening to this Kyle part of my life? More people, aside from my friends, more people knew me as that, you know, than, than Kyle. And when I came to terms with it and realized for the past couple of years, I'd been feeding, you know, essentially this beast, um, it left me just completely lost. And I told you before this, like I, I'd used the captain. I mean, for the most part, everything I wrote under that moniker very much is me, but it was a veil to protect me because if someone disagreed with something I said, or if I'd said something vulnerable, it was like, oh, it's not me, it was the captain saying that. So mm-hmm. it was very easy for me to separate that. Mm-hmm. And so then when it came time that I got in a, re- a very serious relationship with my girlfriend now, we actually ended up getting back together after this, this depressive episode. But when I had to actually be there for a partner and show up as Kyle, I, I found it very difficult. Mm-hmm. And I questioned a lot of what I did. I had a lot of shame and a lot of guilt. And some of that was you know, possibly from my, my Mormon upbringing. And I just felt so lost. I never felt so lost and so purposeless. Mm-hmm. And I was in LA and I was kind of grasping for TV opportunities. I wanted to write in TV. Um, and I remember a producer said to me one time, they were wanting me to host a show and he was calling me about it and i told him that oh you know we're gonna go to cocktails can my girlfriend come and he said to me verbatim he said that kind of sucks to know that the captain has a girlfriend that's not on brand for you Mm. and i was like oh man this is this is not good like now you know my personal desires are interfering with my professional life 
and it just it just spiraled me out of control and i yeah, couldn't it's do almost it anymore like you, you think that in the creating this avatar it's a path to get you what you want no and then the universe is like sure if this is what you want go for it and then you realize like fuck it's not it what made I want, life so much harder than it needed to be right and it's something that um i don't think i'll author another book under that name um the only reason my last book was still under that name is because I have a publishing agreement with that name because there is some weight to it. Sure. And it, I, I don't I don't really want to be seen as that character anymore. And it's been very freeing, especially with, with becoming a dad, with realizing, you know, I don't want my kid to call me the captain. I don't want to be called dad. You know, I don't want to be this character with my son. And it's helped me a lot in embracing Kyle and just in wanting to raise my son without the fear and without the shame, without the guilt that I had, I've gone back to my own childhood. And it's, I've almost like, you know, in raising my son, I feel it kind of like I'm reparenting myself in a way because I'm going back to those time periods in my life and thinking, what did I do that caused me to start to think like this? You know, when did I first develop this, you know, this insecurity in my life? Or when did I first start to worry about this? And in going back and doing that, I feel like I've just discovered so much about myself that I'd lost. Yeah, one of uh, one of the ayahuasca facilitators who uh, sits with us when we go down and work with El Dragon, his name's Valco, and he uh, someone was commenting on a really challenging relationship that they had with their father and how that made their childhood very difficult, and uh, and how this was the ayahuasca was helping to repattern that, and he said it's never too late to have a great childhood. I love that. And I was like, damn, that hits that hits deep because as you're saying, we have the ability to reparent ourselves, mm -hmm. to re-understand mother and father, take that onus off of the two individuals, flawed humans as they mm -hmm. are, however dope our parents were, they're flawed humans, and say, all right, I understand mother and I understand father and I can use those energies to reparent myself now and I can step back into that childlike state of wonder and learning and growth and redo this whole thing and repattern my programming. Like, I think that's one of the flaws of psychology is they're always trying to anchor you back to the childhood as if that childhood is fixed and that's going to dictate things in the future. It's like, okay, yeah, sure. But what if you just redo it? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like, what if you reimagine this and repattern? And it takes a while to repattern things in the brain, but absolutely you can. That's what neuroplasticity is for, is the ability to actually repattern a new story. And I think, you know, it sounds like that's a, a lot of what you're doing. I like what you said about, you know, seeing your parents for who they are, because that's one of the things I struggled with. Um, up until a couple of years ago, when people would talk about their childhood, I'd always joke and say, oh, my parents would never do that to me. They loved me. You know, they wouldn't do that to me. And I had a hard time separating my parents from the parts of my childhood that I think did affect me. And that was the religious aspect of my, mm -hmm. my child, you know, childhood days. Um, and it wasn't until I came to understand that my parents were just doing the best they knew. Like my parents are still very active LDS. They're still more, and we have a fantastic relationship. And LDS is Latter-day Saints for those yes. who don't know. And we have a fantastic relationship. And I don't hold anything against them as far as the way I was raised. They thought they were doing what was right for us. But once I was able to just view my parents as people, I was able to go back and be like, wow, this is why I'm so closed off or why it was so hard for me to open up because growing up, I wanted to talk to my dad man to man, you know, in my teenage years when everyone's confused and I wanted some advice. The, the advice was typically, you know, pray about it, read the scriptures. And I didn't want to hear that. I needed to hear like a human response. I didn't need to hear this religious response yeah. and it closed me off and it made me feel so misunderstood um interesting corollary between that and you being the captain and being misunderstood mm -hmm. it's almost like kyle was always seeking to be seen absolutely and to be loved for who you were as the flesh and blood and spirit animal that you are i was just gonna say i think that's why i developed the captain later in life and grab gravitated towards it so hard is because i'd almost taught myself to do that through my teenage years yeah um i felt misunderstood so i just you know, I, I didn't talk about things i didn't and the captain was my ability to start to talk about things, but test the waters first to see like, how am I, how am I received when I talk about something um, vulnerable or how am I received when I talk about something um, I typically wouldn't want people to know about myself, you know? 
and it allowed me to test the waters, but it still kept that, that barrier up. Mm -hmm. And so I absolutely think that my childhood and the way I was raised affected, you know, 15, 20 years down the line, the way I ran my career and basically my relationships at the time with my friends were still very guarded too. And my friends now, the, the ones I have that have been good friends with me since high school will tell me, oh my God, you were such a better person now. Like you were yeah. fun to hang out with. We liked going to party with you and stuff in your twenties, but you were just, you were just a fucking, you're, you're a wall. You were not an easy person to be around sometimes. Right, right. Yeah. The, uh, the creation of an avatar is something that we don't actually need another moniker to do. I mm -hmm. think so many of us are trapped in a prison of our own identity complex. Yeah. And you could, could be going by your name, but you've put on a persona that people expect. I remember when I was partying hard in my late 20s and you know, even into my early 30s a bit, but particularly my late 20s, that's when I was probably the most unhappy because I hadn't started on it yet. You know, I was still, I had a, this marketing company and I was helping my stepdad's company, Fleshlight, sell Fleshlights. Mm -hmm. And I fucking, I was like, this is the most pointless thing in the world that I could possibly do. And I was working for investment banking, you know, little projects about pharmaceuticals that I didn't really care about or a gold mining project or a natural gas project or fucking some kind of beauty nutraceutical type situation. I was like, I don't even know if this even works, but I'm gonna have a marketing company, so I'm gonna do it. And I had no sense of real purpose. Mm -hmm. So I was just fucking partying and I had fun. I had a great time. I was with my partner at the time, Caitlin, and we were good at partying. You know, we could throw a good party. We had a lot of like that energy where we would stand on top of a table and like cultivate this cyclone of energy that would make everything more fun. You know, when somebody's really getting it and putting out that energy, it's contagious. And then the, when you hear people say stuff like, oh, you throw the best parties. Oh, oh that was the, it, that was it. it that's, the, that's exactly and what you want. Then, then you, it reassures and you're like, all right, I'm going to keep doing this. Yeah. And then, so I would go out, to, go out to the club one day and I just wouldn't have that kind of energy, but I'd be enjoying myself. I'd just be more chill. They'd be like, what's wrong with you, man? Are you all right? <laughs> like, what's going on? I was like, I'm fucking fine. You stand on the table. <laughs> I'm not going to do it today. You know, like, and it, but it was this persona that I had that I was going to be the dude with sunglasses on the inside or whatever the fuck it was and be like fucking raging. Yeah. And when I wouldn't, people would be like, what's up, man? What's going on? And so I was trapped mm -hmm. even in my own name, even in, just by the persona that I'd created. And that wasn't fun at all. That's exactly know? how I felt. I think the most unhappy I ever was when I was living in New York City in a luxury tower, making a good salary, working in advertising, and I traveled all the time for work. And all I did was, I mean, primarily my clientele base was bars and hotels. And so my job just revolved around going out. And I, I remember one time being in a club and I overheard someone say, I like hanging out with Kyle because he pays for everything. <laughs> and it just hit me in the gut. Yeah. And I remember starting to tear up in the club and I was like, is this what my life has become? Like if I become these guys that I used to make fun of when I was first going out and sure. you can see the guy that everyone's just kind of taking advantage of, like, am I this person now? And I just walked out on the check. I didn't pay it. I walked out <laughs> yeah. and I left and everyone was calling me, didn't answer my phone. I just went home and laid in bed and just kind of broke down and thought, wow, this, this life is so empty. Yeah. Um, and it was the same thing you're saying when you, I, if I didn't want to go out yeah. on like a Thursday, like, why aren't you, what's going on? Like, why, why don't you want to come out? Or, you know, especially the time I was, I was really big into cocaine. And if I wasn't either getting it or I wasn't using it, everyone was like, why aren't, why, you don't want to party tonight? Like, why, why, why don't you have cocaine with you? And it just became, it was just such an empty existence. It's and prison. it was so hard to feel like I could be myself in any scenario. Mm -hmm. Like, and I felt like I always had to be on. And like you said, it was fun, but I would never want to go through that again. Yeah. There's nothing in you could do that would make me want to live that lifestyle again. Mm -hmm. So this podcast and pretty much everything I do is made possible by Onnit. And the great thing about Onnit is it's a company where I created all of the best products that would support me in a holistic life, physically, mentally, through all of the human optimization technologies that Onnit offers and is available. 
And this ranges from kettlebells to the steel clubs, the steel maces to the alpha brain, which I use before every podcast and the shroom tech, which I use before every workout and the total NO that I use when I want to flex in the gym and have a really good workout. Really everything that I've ever wanted from a human optimization standpoint is offered through Onnit. So I encourage you guys to check it out. Go to onnit.com slash Aubrey and you'll save 10% off absolutely everything and thank you for your support of On It, which is directly support to me. Thanks, fam. People think, you know, people will say like, oh, Aubrey, you know, it's so admirable how vulnerable you are. You know, it's something that I'm known for because I'll just, after that, I decided, all right, this is not the way. I'm just going to talk about everything. When I had a podcast, whether it was going on Rogan's or my own podcast or my own posts or whatever, I would just really try to let people open the shutters into my inner life people are like wow it's so courageous i'm like kinda but not really because when people actually see you then you have the chance to actually be loved and then you have the chance to actually be free mm. so it's actually a self-preservation model well, and it helps to, you to, as much as it's helping them absolutely absolutely so you're doing something that's of service to everybody around you and giving them the permission to be vulnerable and it kind of breaks down the the trap that you've laid for yourself mm. where people can actually see you in your totality and it's actually a, a very liberating thing and yeah i get i get it that it might be scary at first when you start down that path but once you start getting the feedback from it internally and externally you realize like oh no this is the only way mm -hmm. like this is the only way to exist and yeah sure i mean when you were in i don't know middle school or something vulnerability was dangerous you know because there's so many bullies who are afraid of this and that, that dynamics of you know potentially being bullied well, or made fun of but it changes and you hear this masculinity movement where i heard someone say the other day um don't call it vulnerability call it humility because vulnerability means you can be attacked and I was like, what a pathetic way to look at it. <laughs> right. And it was from one of these like, you know, alpha male kind of individuals who is all about trying to promote like this modern alpha male uh, persona. And what you're saying about it being liberating is after I had this moment in 2019, you know, I came back to using social media again and I put my real name on social media. Up until that point, no one really knew who I was. I didn't have like a personal Facebook or anything, you know, yeah. early in life. It, social media never really appealed to me. And so people literally couldn't find out who I was. And so when I came back with my name on there, I had people just writing me that were blown away that I did that. And then when I came back, I admitted that I had been in a dark place where I started, you know, romanticizing suicide. And I think it's common for people to start to romanticize it, but then I started to actually really think about how, when, and where kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's when I knew I was getting pretty dark. And I came back and I wrote a long caption about it on Instagram. And I had so many thousands of messages from people saying, because you admitted that my husband decided to go to therapy. You know, I don't feel so alone. Like I, I thought I was never gonna get past this, but seeing that you live in the lifestyle that I thought I wanted to live or willing to talk about that, now I'm willing to explore um, healing myself. And I had, you know, an individual write me that was a Navy SEAL and he and six of his buddies that were all, you know, veterans got together and started their own therapy group, reading circles and stuff like that. And I saw the ripple effect that I had. And it's kind of what we talked about before this podcast where I do feel like I'm called to do more at this point in my life with the platform I've built. I just don't know what it is yet. And I have people say similar things to me, like, how are you so vulnerable? How do you talk about this? And I tell them, well, when you've admitted to half a million people, you want to kill yourself, like nothing could really hurt you after that. Yeah, totally. Like there's very few things I can get out that are more embarrassing than that <laughs> because a lot of people feel it's embarrassing to admit they were that dark. Um, but after so many people know that about me, it's like, you don't have much more dirt on me that's going to make me feel feel worse than I did at that time. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very easy for me to talk about topics that um, other people wouldn't. Like before I do a podcast, the host, you know, says, is, it, is anything off limits? Um, no. And it'd be very hypocritical of me to say there was something off limits because right. as a writer, I don't think you can be a good writer with a guard. There was some, I think it was, I don't know if it was Stephen King or some great writer who said that for every person that you were worried about reading your writing, 
you can take 10% off the greatness of your book. I think it's Stephen King. I actually think it's in his memoir on writing. Yeah. Where he talks about that. He talks about what's helped him write. I'm pretty sure that's where that's from. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is too. And and that's that's really, really accurate with any part of your art. You know, when your art is constricted by, oh, what if my mom reads this? Or what if my dad reads this? Or what if the world sees the truth about me? You're never going to be able to actually produce mm-hmm. art that's worth a shit. Well, it's one of the things I talk about a lot too is I hate artists and writers and creators calling their work content. Um, it's a dirty word to me. And I think it kind of diminishes your own creativity and your own power. Um, it's really disheartening for me to say, when you hear someone say, oh, I just wrote this great piece of content. It's right. Like, it's not fucking content. Like content then, it's about, then it's about the, the, the function of it, not about that. How's it going to feed the algorithm? Yeah, How's totally. it going to get like content? The, the name alone is meant to be something that gets seen and shared and viral. And that's, that's not a way to create art. And admittedly in the past, I did that, you know, often when I was first kind of building my online presence, particularly because I was working in advertising at the time, you know, in early like 2014, 15, when I was kind of figuring out how these social channels worked, um, I was a writer. I mean, I, I wrote for commercials for TV. And so I knew how to write stuff that got interaction. I knew how to write stuff that got people to share it. And I utilized a lot of it to grow my, my following the way I did. And then it got to a point where it just felt so dirty because the whole reason I wanted to have a presence online was so I could write stuff I wanted to write. Mm-hmm. stuff I couldn't write on TV, stuff I couldn't write for a client. And so once I realized I was doing that, I was like, this is just making this side work too now. Now it's now I'm just writing work on both ends and it just, it's not motivating to create with that mindset. And there's still far too many people out there that have that, especially when you see, you know, these younger individuals trying to uh, to find ways to be relevant with their art or their content, as they would say. Um you can just see how empty it is. Like people can see right through that shit. People can see when vulnerability is actually just oversharing or yeah. when it's actually or it's vulnerability. A, or it's a strategy. People can see that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, sometimes, I don't know if you've ever found this, but, you know, one of the other traps too is if you get into those, those comparisons of other people who are doing something and you're like, Dude, I can fucking see through that. But look at those millions of followers and look at them in the top, mm. you know, top 50 of the iTunes podcasts. And, and like, you just kind of see something that isn't quite, and it, it'll work. And I think that's the, that's the trap that you, it'll quote work mm. in, in some way, but it just depends on the metrics that you look at. And then you could say like, well, fuck, you know, like they're doing it better than me. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, exactly it's, it's just talking. a trap. I'm feeling well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the worst is when you can see someone and you're intelligent enough to see them as a fraud <laughs> and other people can't yet. Yeah. And you're just like, fuck, man, how can no one see this? Like, yeah. this is so fake. And it, <laughs> you, you know from your experience that it is and it's frustrating to watch and too many people are going to fall into trying to be just like that person, which just perpetuates that cycle of, you know, fake creation on social media. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't even know where I was going to go with that. I got lost, but well, let's go. I just, I just let's, started thinking too much about people that I I think are frauds <laughs> online. I yeah, got distracted. No, I, it, it is, it's a, it's a, it's a definitely a trap, and you can yeah, get yeah, stuck yeah, in that yeah. cycle, and then you can get bitter, and then you can get you resentful. can get caught in that cycle, and then you can also you know one of the challenges it can actually start to affect how much you love the world mm-hmm. because you can hold this resentment like world you're so stupid like you're gonna recognize you're this. gonna you're gonna you're gonna appreciate this well fuck you then world mm. and it's this somewhat self-righteous entitled and also judgmental attitude that will actually also sap your ability to create and your ability to produce art and actually sing your own true name song and your own and really offer your medicine in a way because you'll start to get this bitterness in you and that bitterness is something that I think we also have to be really mindful of because it's only going to you know be a hindrance to our ability to actually do what we're here to do. Well, when you talk about that bitterness, it, you know, when you look at the last 2 years um a lot of people and my girlfriend says this very well when you operate with the, the idea of being against something um you don't create at the level you would if you're for something. And so she always tries to say, be for something, be for something. Um, And she can tell when I start to slip into those kind of bitterness realms and, you know, cynicism. And there's a lot of people who falsely believe cynicism is a sign of intellect. And so 
I'll fall into that trap every so often. And she'll be like, no, you got to be for something, like yeah. stop being against something. And I think a lot of people have found their identity in being against something yeah. um, in the past two years. And you can see it. Like they just can't let things go. Mm-hmm. They will harp on the exact same subject or topic for two and a half fucking years. And because it's continuing to get them relevancy. And I just don't understand how you can do that and consider yourself any kind of artist or writer or creator. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think there are, some people believe that just highlighting the darkness over and over and over again and pointing to the darkness is the way that you actually heal the darkness. And there's a good place for it. I mean, the darkness, bringing light to the darkness is one path. But also what's dark is as in in the shadow as in not revealed is the light that's within all humanity the the light that's within every bit of darkness that's the sparks of love and the sparks of humanity that are within everybody and Mm -hmm. so i think you can choose which way you want to go and i actually had this conversation recently where i passed on participating in you know a content produce a art producer, content producer. I don't know exactly. I'm not going to make that kind of judgment call, but I was like, man, like, it's not that I disagree with what you're saying. I actually agree with most of what you're saying, but your platform and your Dharma is right now to be continually pointing at the darkness. And there's, it's an all you can eat buffet. If you want to do that, Mm -hmm. it's fucking everywhere, but I would much prefer to find the commonality of light and beauty that's within everybody and then bring harmony through the recognition of the light that's within all of us, even those who we judge as the darkest. And I think that's the way to actually heal rather than create additional divisiveness. I think that's something you do very well with your platform just from listening to it. Um, But a good analogy would be, you know, just calling attention to something is like apologizing, but not actually changing what, you know, caused the problem in the first place. You can apologize all you want, but unless you actually change that, behavior that character trait is pointless Mm -hmm. and that's the same as what you're saying just shining light on the dark all the time okay what's the solution like how do you illuminate that like how do you get rid of that darkness and without you know being for something um you won't find that yeah when uh i want to touch back on something you said from that you know that alpha male perspective (laughs) like if you're vulnerable if you say you're vulnerable that means you're going to get attacked like the question that I would want to ask is like, okay, then what? You know what I mean? It's like, they don't fall like, okay, then what? Yeah. So what? So you're attacked. Like that's where you actually decide whether you're vulnerable or not, because you're not going to avoid being able, being attacked. Nothing you fucking do is going to prevent that. It's like, and now what? And now what? Now what happens? How do you respond when you actually are attacked? Like, what are you really made of when shit gets gnarly? You know, and when that happens, are you vulnerable then? Are you going to be brittle? Are you going to break? Are you going to resort to rage and, and the kind of violence of mind? Or are you going to be able to assimilate that and withstand that and bear it? And that's, to me, true strength. That's true masculinity. It's the ability to hold like a fucking mountain and say, wind and tempest and lightning do your worst. Mm-hmm. And whether the fucking fire comes and sweeps across all the brush, that's all right. I'm the fucking mountain. I'm the rocks that are underneath that, that have been there for eons and i'm going to be here for eons and i'm actually not vulnerable because i'm willing to withstand the attack and i think that's just a whole way to reframe this kind of very brittle understanding of masculinity which is like it's it's funny it's like it's almost another type of facade and I think someone who'd say they're afraid of being attacked knows they can't weather that storm. Yeah, totally. Like you, you, you're essentially ad- admitting that you can't weather it. Yeah. When you say that's your fear, um, you know, it's it, it, you know, if you're a fighter, for example, and you're afraid of getting punched, you're never going to be a good fighter. <laughs> totally, totally. So I think that's almost you know, in a way, trying to be an alpha male, you're admitting that you're not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. I can think of, I'm a big fight fan and I remember watching, you know, a lot of fights back in the day, but, and all love and credit to anybody who steps in the cage. I mean, the amount of courage that it requires to actually go and do that, but you could see the people who really didn't like to get punched, Mm. you know, and I don't know, I feel bad even naming names, but there's some big heavyweight fighters like, oh, damn, this guy is the fucking manliest man of all. But then you watch him get hit and you see them wince in the way of like, oh my God, 
what just happened to me? And this is all the way back in the pride days. You know, the biggest, the biggest fighters that you could possibly imagine, fucking muscle bound, steroided to the hilt. And then you watch them get hit and they're like, oh my God, what just happened? And I would think, you know, I'm not as big a fight fan as you are. I've watched a fair share of it, but I would imagine that in being afraid to get hit, it causes you to make mistakes that actually make you of course. more susceptible to losing in general. Absolutely. And so, you know, it's been that kind of back into what we're talking about. If you're going through life afraid to get hit or attacked, it's going to cause you to do things that are going to hinder you even more in life. Mm-hmm. I remember one fight on the positive side of this, and it was when Conor McGregor was making his run, and I went to all of his fights and sat down there on the floor. That was a fun time. Seat. I, I was, that was active in time. watching fights during that time that because was, I appreciated the uh, persona he created around himself. Oh, I thought it, it was entertaining. It was magnificent. And it made you give a shit. Yeah, it was magnificent. And I think he's fallen off the rails in a lot of ways, especially after that last fight with Dustin Poirier. I was like, come on, man, this isn't funny anymore. Like you've crossed the line when he's talking about Dustin's wife. I was like, this is terrible. All that being, he, used, he needed to get some new writers for his show. Yeah, for sure. It's like a late night host. He, <laughs> his sure. stick was up, and he needed to actually admit it and hire some writers to help him. <laughs> totally, totally. But when he was in the red panty night kind of kind of moment of yeah. his career, but I remember seeing something really fucking incredibly admirable about that. He had a he had a knee injury, and he was fighting Chad Mendez, and he so he wasn't so mobile but his, his mind was still fucking impenetrable at that mm-hmm. point. And I remember Chad had taken him down. Chad was an amazing wrestler and you know grabbed him, threw him down, was taking him down. And I was watching him. He was pressed up against the cage close to yeah, where I was. He had a knee injury at this Yeah, time. He, had a, he had a knee injury in that fight. And Chad was just bouncing elbows off of his, off of his face. And I could hear Connor. I could hear him go like, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to fight. And he was just talking (laughs) shit the whole time. His elbows are just raining down, blood's dripping down. He's like, just fucking wait. I'm going to stand up and I'm going to knock you out. And obviously he said that in his own Connor way. I'm paraphrasing, but I could just, I watched him, you know, blocking what he could, but just looking at him and just telling him exactly what's going to happen. And then sure enough, towards the end of the round, he stands up, moves forward, and then hits him with that strong left hand and drops him and knocks him out. And it was like, I was like, holy shit, like that's the way to fucking do it. It's just to take, weather that entire storm and just be looking through the storm and be like, I got you, motherfucker. Yeah. And Chad's like bouncing elbows off his head in a totally dominant position. But his will and his like, his, it was so penetrating what he was doing from a psychological standpoint that he manifested that reality. I've always, when it comes to athletes, I've never been an underdog fan. I've always appreciated the individuals who are very outspoken and Mm -hmm. can back it up. Um, I like watching them lose just as much, but someone who can talk shit like that and have that little of confidence and back it up, I think is more enjoyable to watch than the underdog. Of course. I I just love it. I respect it. I respect the, the, uh, I respect the, the courage it takes. And if a lot of it's an act or not, I still respect it. It's just, it's, it's some, it's a belief that very few people will ever have in themselves. Yeah. That's the intoxicating thing. And you can just look at it based on the pay-per-view buys and numbers. Mm-hmm. When somebody cultivates that air, then it's like, it's intoxicating, mm-hmm. you know, and it doesn't matter whether it was Connor or, you know, Adesanya or whoever it is, when they bring that kind of energy, it's like, holy shit, let's yeah. go, you know, let's watch this thing. Or, you know, Tyson Fury, the Gypsy King, I think he's also one of the most like, exciting people to watch because he just cultivates this air of fucking confidence and then he wins the wins the bout and he fucking sings a song as his post fight, post fight interview to the whole crowd That's and he's awesome. not a good singer but it's just there's a certain energy that we can tap into that uh that i think we all want we all want to feel that it's uh-huh. a sense of like radical aliveness in the moment and sheer like unwavering confidence and when we see that and the brashness. And I think another part of humility, like you mentioned humility, another part of humility is being humble enough to express how you're great you are. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. that's one, something that I think a lot of people are shy about. I think humility is expressing the truth. And if you think you're the baddest motherfucker and you're like, you know, I just like to get in there and work hard and you know, it's all about, it's like, no, we want them to hear what they really believe, which is like, oh yeah, I'm the fucking baddest. This is something that a friend of mine, Andy Frisella, talks about often is uh, sharing your wins. Mm-hmm. Um, 
because society nowadays has almost made it seem as though it's just overly cocky or it's uh, out of touch to share your wins when you have been successful. And he's, he's a big proponent of telling people like, no, like if you've done well, you owe it to the generation below you to talk about it and believe in yourself enough to yeah. talk about it because that's how they find inspiration. Like it helps other people when you're willing to be like that, when you're afraid to talk about your greatness or you're afraid to accept what you've done that's hard. It just shows people that's not possible themselves. It's another fear of, it's another fear of vulnerability, you know, and I think- Would you I'm, be attacked for that, for of sure. Of course, you know, and yeah, I've had, I have, I went to school for a semester in University of Queensland in Australia, hmm. and then I dated an Aussie for a while and had a lot of Aussie friends. And they actually have a, a phrase that they call tall poppy syndrome, which is they have in their culture this belief that the tallest poppy is the one that gets cut down. So if there's a flower that rises hmm. above the rest, that's when everybody's coming with the garden shears you know, to well, cut it's not it down. a wrong belief to have. It's not I mean, a wrong. It's a truth it's, that it's happens. Act, it does happen, but then it prevents people from actually, first of all, stepping out and being brave enough to be the tall poppy. Yeah. And then also, if they are the tall poppy, just naturally by who they are, they're always diminish, self diminishing themselves, which is another seductive, dishonest strategy to not get attacked. You know, it's like, well, it's like you said. There's a there's an air of uh, being holier than thou when you when you feel like you're being humble. Yep. And you see a lot of people do that online too, where they're afraid to, they, they want everything, they, they want to have that underdog story so bad, or they want to tell the story of how they struggled, or they don't want to admit, you know, any lucky breaks because they're afraid it diminishes, you know, what they've done. Mm -hmm. And like you said, it's just another way of suppressing yourself and self-suppression is a recipe for depression. Well said. It well just said. it just is. I think, you know, I talked about this recently on, on my social media, faking who we are, whether we fake how we feel or we fake what we believe. And you've seen a lot of people do this the past two years where they fake what they believe because they don't want to be attacked by the, the mob or they fake, you know, their persona. You're, you're just, you're asking for a down. It's going to happen. There's going to be a moment where you're going to have to come to terms with yourself and it's not going to be comfortable. Yeah. It's going to be hard as hell. I remember, you know, during the, during the kind of the height of the pandemic, I was just holding back a mm. lot of my beliefs, like what I really felt. And it felt like I was suffocating actually, you know, and this was when, I mean, people were being crazy. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy to think right now, like right now COVID still exists all over the place and people are getting it, getting it and just mm -hmm. fucking shrugging it off. It's like people are just dealing with it. But then it was like such a fucking big deal, you know, and, and well, there's the cognitive dissonance of the difference between now and then is, is kind of like outrageous to look at. It's almost when you think back on how it was two years ago, it feels like a dream. Like it doesn't, it, <laughs> right. it, it's. Right. I remember, you know, seeing images of them digging mass graves in Central Park. And I remember like all this weird stuff going around. I, I talked to my friend. I was like, did that really happen? Or did I just imagine that? Like, did that, did, <laughs> was it really that bad at one time? And, you know, the, the refrigerator trucks full of bodies and all that yeah. stuff that was going around. That, they really had that propaganda and they had that fear mongering out there. Mm -hmm. And it feels, it just, it, it feels like it never happened. Like you're saying it. It was so extreme, and I was like you at the you know the beginning of it too, where I was afraid to express how I felt. And then I realized my entire career was predicated on the fact that I was willing to speak out yeah. and express my opinion. And if I didn't do it during a time where there was so much blatant manipulation happening or shame and guilt being pushed on people, it felt like I was just failing everything I'd, I'd done as a writer up to that point. Right. And so I write stuff that one week will have people feeling I'm very conservative. And the next week I'll write something that has people feeling I'm very liberal. And it's a good thing because it means I'm a person. Like of I think course. most people are in the middle. And I had someone say to me one time, you know, why aren't you choosing a side? 
I'd say I have chosen a side. I've chosen the side of people. Yeah, like, team people, baby. I, I'm Let's the, go. I'm, I'm the yeah. I'm the side of everyone. Like yeah. I'm the side of humanity. And, and people hate that. They want to put you on a they team. They hate here. They want to put you on yeah. one team or the other. Which well, which jersey are you wearing? Fucking neither. Because they want they want to uh, be able to predict what you're going to think next. Yeah. I think unpredictability. Um, it's why people try and control their own life, but it's also what makes. It's also what people have a hard time accepting someone who's unpredictable because mm -hmm. they want to know where you're going next with everything. And if they can put a label on you, they feel like they can believe, you know, oh, this is safely what he's going to do next. Yeah. And so when you don't do that, it drives people crazy. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know. It's, uh, it's interesting because you see, and you know, you watch, I'm rewatching, uh, Game of Thrones because my wife, Vailana, hasn't seen it. Fuck. That's a good show. By the way, like I actually had the box set and I've never opened it. Oh, I've shit. seen a couple episodes on TV. Oh and man, you'll get into it. it's such a good. And I'm seeing it. I'm seeing how genius the writing is. Yeah. How they've like how they foreshadow little bits of things that I didn't catch the first time because I didn't know where it was going. Mm -hmm. And I see how they dropped little clues all the way. Like the writing is so good. The acting is so good. Obviously, the, st the story is so unpredictable, and I'm watching her not knowing, you know, what's going to happen. Which he's falling in love with a hero, and that hero gets his fucking head cut off, and she's like, "What the fuck just happened?" You know, so many things about it are are great. But one of the things that you realize is in there, in that story, much like in real life, in this kind of Machiavellian court of the king, or subject to the, you know, the, the lynch mob back then, you had to be really careful because you could literally find yourself under the guillotine mm. if you said the wrong thing. So everybody was very measured and political and full of shit. Everybody was lying. I mean, this is the, the idea in, in the kind of the, the main court. It's King's Landing and everybody's a liar there. And they talk about how everybody's just manipulative and lying because there was actual real threat to that. And in some ways, the culture we're in now, there is real threat in that you can get canceled. And lots of people did and got deplatformed and a lot of shitty things that could affect quality of life to a certain degree. But it's not the same as it was because nobody's actually coming to kill you, mm -hmm. actually. And so, yes, it requires courage, but actually if we look and say, what are they really actually doing? They're just throwing pixels at me, like pixels <laughs> that make words on a fucking post. you know. And those, the people who've been able to stick to their truth and just walk through it, ultimately they've all walked through it unless they've done something actually legitimately egregious uh -huh. then of course there's consequences of that you know there's consequences to your actions but the people who've just said nah I, i'm not gonna allow this to diminish me and allow me to suppress myself i mean i just have such admiration for people who've had that courage and recognizing that it may seem like life or death when you know the twitter lynch mob comes after you just half fucking bots anyways at least like but really though you're gonna be okay it's a three-day rule 72 hours they'll be upset about something else right um and i actually talk about in that book speech therapy um you know how to handle you know being canceled or people coming after you and just like you said i think you have to allow it to happen i actually think it's a choice people make to allow themselves to be canceled because if you just keep going forward like you're like you said earlier keep weathering that storm in three days five days a week it's going to be gone mm -hmm. and the people you talk about and i'm sure we can probably name names here but if you watch how they handled it it's typically what they did just keep walking they forward. kept doing what they kept doing they kept saying what they kept saying apologize if they, if they needed to if they if they did something they felt was truly wrong they'll apologize but the worst thing you can do is apologize for something that you don't believe was wrong. Nope. Because as soon as you do that, for you honest. feed, you feed them <laughs> yeah. and you have given them power over your beliefs. And that's just a whole form of self-betrayal. Yeah. It's gaslighting yourself mm -hmm. in a way. And, and really, like you said, complete self-betrayal. And so holding, holding true and then having that ability to weather that storm and say like, no, this is what I believe. Change your, and also don't be stubborn. If, oh. you, if your belief changes, a lot of times you do learn. A lot of times you'll you'll say something and be like, damn, like I didn't think of, I didn't really think of that. Yeah. I wasn't sensitive to that thing. So then fucking acknowledge that. Or you know? like cats aren't that bad. You know, cats are actually <laughs> right. pretty fucking cool. <laughs> like why have I been talking shit on these felines for so many years when they're actually really good? Yeah. And I have no problem admitting that now. <laughs> but uh, I'm all for changing your opinion when you're preventing 
you know, presented with new information. It's changing your opinion based on what you believe is public opinion. That yep. is the big mistake. To make. Yeah, you start to lose. You start to lose yourself, and, and that's like, when you're. That's when you're building an avatar. Mm -hmm. You're you're responding with what people want to hear, and and you know you do that long enough for a couple of years, you're going to get to a point in your life when something really, you know, traumatic is going to happen, and you need yourself to fall back on, and you don't know who that person is. Yeah, and you're not ready, and you're not. You haven't been putting in the work to actually support yourself through it. You know, uh, an interesting meditation that I've been in and a contemplation, I should say, um, is understanding that there's, you know, there's this idea about power corrupting. And I've never agreed with this idea. Like power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. I forget which, which guy fucking said that, but everybody parrots that same mm -hmm. thing. And I strongly disagree with that statement because I think power can reveal your innate corruption that you already have, but it doesn't create anything. It just actually reveals what's, what's really there. And so I've been contemplating this and, I, and I've believed that firmly from the beginning, but I've been contemplating that, you know, as I've gotten more entrenched critics and people and haters out there. And there's this, there's this one group and I don't want to give them any more light, but they continue to just produce content, just fucking complete bullshit you know, about making shit up about me. And obviously, you know, I have plenty of forays into the magical realms. Well, someone told me you were a cult leader before I came on of this. Of course. Before I came on <laughs> this course. podcast. And, of course. And, and I told him, I said, that means he sounds like an interesting person to talk to. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I want to know who a cult leader is. <laughs> I don't yeah. believe it, but I've, I've heard that shit. For, for you, my donation-based coaching just program. Just through friends of mine. Yeah. Just when I told my friend, I was, oh, I'm going to go to Austin. What for? Oh, I got a book signing. I'm going to go talk to Aubrey Marcus. Oh, that guy runs a cult. Like, I was like, <laughs> no, he doesn't. Like, have you looked at anything this guy does? Yeah. And so it's ideas like that, right? Which are like, Kind of awesome, fuck? though, what? at the same time. <laughs> They're kind of awesome. Yeah. There's like, a... <laughs> I think of all the things you could be accused of in life, being yeah. a cult leader is near the top of cool things to be accused of. Like, Fair I, enough. Fair I honestly enough. believe that. I used to tell people, it's funny, when I, was, uh, when I was working in advertising, I said, the ultimate example of being a good marketer is starting a cult. <laughs> like, if you can't start a cult, you're not as good as you think you are. And so I used to joke, I was like, you know when I'm like in my 70s, I'm just going to start a cult just to see if I'm as good as I believe I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, in any case, there's obviously a lot of negative associations with that and a bunch of bullshit that's not there. And I think cult, the root of cult is cultist, which means to worship. And it's also a part of culture. It's like, mm -hmm. it's, it's creating something that people actually care about. And what people are talking about is our fit for service platform, which people fucking care about because you're going through initiatory practices together. We're doing breath work and ecstatic dance, but all of the shitty parts about being a cult, which is actually planting ideas in other people's heads that aren't their own or keeping them stuck or using leverage or all that. And there's none of that. People come in and they come out whenever they want to go to a summit, they can. And when they don't want to go to a summit, they don't. Well, it's not like a religion where you're requiring tithes every week. No, and... or is there a fixed set of beliefs? Uh -huh. We're like, what do you discover when you breathe? Like, figure it out and then talk about it. You know, it's like, it's the antithesis yeah. of what that is. But these these peop the people like the people who with malice and also self interest who are promoting themselves by trying to tear me down, the med the contemplation was is like, if I had absolute power to be a wizard, you know, be an actual like wizard, like a Maine Coon cat, like a Maine Coon cat yeah. with spells, just and stoic, I could, and I could just I could just like cast a spell, and that person would be walking near one of those little parking things and just slip and fall and then the nuts would crack right on the thing <laughs> like would i do that like would i i mean obviously i'm not thinking about death or anything like that yeah. but would i like would i like be malicious back if i had that power to just cast a spell and do it and and when you receive malice and you had the power to actually be malicious back and you could do that without any consequences would you and like how so like the question then is, and this is, goes back to the power, is like if you had that power, then you would really know how good are you? Mm -hmm. You know, like how I say, like receive that, you know, receive that and see beneath that and find the love that's underneath. And this is a deep part of my belief, but really like only in this contemplation have I realized like, 
well, fuck, if I was tested in that way, it would be a test. And I would have to pass through the gate at the point of receiving all of this malice. Could I pass through the gate and not use my power to actually be vengeful in that moment? You know, like how good well, it sounds like the only, the only way to figure that out is to start an actual cult. <laughs> you got to like actually start it and see what you do with it. Like you have to, yeah. you think you're doing it just to test yourself. <laughs> Just get to that point and be like, all right, I, I'm good. Now I don't need this anymore. Yeah, I think the, uh, and, and the, ultimately, you know, Don Howard, one of my spiritual teachers, always talked about that. Like anybody on this path has to confront the path of power mm -hmm. and the path of power over other people. Well, and like, what do you do when you have that? What do you do when you have that power? How, how do you respond? And that's how you actually get to know yourself. And when you know yourself as powerful and you know that you could, but you don't, then you know yourself as good yeah. because you've actually had the choice. It's like what Chris Rock used to say about you're only as faithful as your options. Mm -hmm. Like there's something That's really true quote. about that. Yeah. Like, are you faithful? I don't know. Has the Victoria's Secret model hit you up when you're on that business trip? Yeah. What are your the DMs end of the look night, like right now? And you already said goodnight to your partner and she's like, come up to my room with me. And you're like, fucking A. Like that's when you know if you're faithful. You know if you're faithful when you pass that crucible and you pass mm -hmm. that test. And it's not like, fuck, I don't know if I'll get caught. But if it's something like, no, my integrity says says no. And then you really know yourself. Jordan Peterson says the same thing. You know yourself when you test yourself. And I think like finding, even if you're doing it hypothetically, like understanding that a lot of us really don't know how good we are or how or what we are until we've actually walked through that a little bit and recognized our own personal power and then decided, okay, I actually know who I am because I've made these choices. And then you start to make those positive choices. Then you really actually know yourself. And then that unwavering knowledge of self actually makes you invulnerable to those attacks because you're like, no, actually you're fucking full of shit. It's like if somebody, if you really know your sexual, your sexuality, for example, and someone, it used to be an attack. It doesn't happen anymore because people know better, but like people would call you homosexual right in not those nice words right but if you know you're like bro like i'm not gay like you really know that it mm -hmm. doesn't hurt but if you're like fuck i was looking at gay porn the other day and i, I just don't know <laughs> then it's like how dare you i can't believe you get all fr flustered because you don't actually know yeah and so i think if you get to the point where you really know yourself and you're like no i actually i actually know who i am and because I've tested it and I understand, I understand what, I, what is actually really inside. That's the path to like really being strong and really being free. Well, this comes back to what we were talking about with vulnerability. Like uh, the more you do it, the more you realize it's not as bad as you made it out to be in your head. And you are testing yourself every time you speak out and express your true opinion. Yeah. Um, and then you have, you feel more comfortable doing it the next time and the next yeah. time. And then when it really fucking matters, when something huge happens, you're not even going to second guess yourself because you're so comfortable with who you are and you've been through the crucible of people trying to cancel you. You've dealt with uh, thousands of DMs of people talking shit on you. Mm -hmm. So when you need to rely on yourself, you have yourself to rely on. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a, uh, it's an important thing to like, I think people are afraid also in some way of power because they're, they don't know they don't know themselves. They don't know what they would do. They're I not really to, sure. I used to tell my buddies, I, I remember in my 20s, I used to tell my friends, like, I am glad I'm not rich because I think I'd be dead. Um, and, <laughs> right. and, and I meant it. you didn't trust, in, you in, did not, you didn't trust 20, yourself for strength. In my 20s, if I would have had enough income, I would have probably just partied my ass off. I would have done so much stupid shit with that money because um, I didn't trust myself. I was trying to find myself. And... Um, I heard someone say once that it's not wanting money that's wrong. It's what you want to do with that money that's wrong. Yeah. Like there's no problem with becoming wealthy and successful, but why do you want to be wealthy and successful? And it, mm. you know, dovetails with what you're saying about what do you do with power? Yeah. And, you know, at the time my twenties, I meant it. Like I am, I am to this day, I'm very glad I was not that successful in my twenties. <laughs> we wouldn't be talking today. I know I wouldn't have, cause I know the shit I did do. Right. And if I would have had that kind of, you know, power, because money is power in a way, I, I would have abused it for well, sure. And, and you see that with so many, you know, child stars or so many people who come into fame. Mm -hmm. Fame is even, it's even more dangerous than money or, Especially, you know, it, it depends on how you got that fame too. Of course, of course. And then at that point, 
you can see this slippery slope and decline and it's almost like they haven't been tempered quite enough to to reveal the cracks that were innately there mm -hmm. their own kind of attachment to their ego their own desire for you know the darker side of the implementation of power right and they haven't tempered themselves and so when that power comes they're not really ready for it and so i think it's a process and they don't have the people around them who also you know because power can create this distortion field where everybody really wants something from you and i think that's also the other mm -hmm. dangerous part they don't have real friends that are they'll be like what the fuck are you doing man like what 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 the fuck was that like imagine becoming incredibly famous for lip syncing on TikTok. Like if you've built this whole platform, you know, you got these people that have nine, 10 million followers for lip syncing and doing dance videos. And then you suddenly have all this money and all this fame and you're faced with a moment that requires real integrity. Yeah. You're not gonna have it because yeah. you, you didn't come into power by having integrity. You came into power by either being attractive or cute or, you know, or silly and those are the kind of people you're talking about the child stars who have the biggest downfalls because you know it's it's uh it's similar to uh they talk about this in the nfl they call it helmet syndrome where you get these kids that are straight out of college and next thing you know they're playing the nfl they have all this money and i can't remember what the statistic is but the majority of nfl players go bankrupt later in life because they never had to manage small amounts of money. Sure. And so they suddenly have a lot to manage. And like you're saying, everyone around them takes advantage of them. And they call it helmet syndrome because they're not as recognizable as say a basketball player or a fighter yeah. because they have the helmet on on the field. So when they do go out, they want to be seen and they want to be appreciated. And yeah, so they have, the, they have a tendency to spend more money. They have a tendency to be the most boisterous. Um, and it comes from, you know, what we're saying, like you don't, you don't slowly build that based on integrity. And it's yep. just, if you don't have the right people around you to instruct you on how to use that kind of power, that's where people have that mindset, the ultimate power corrupts. Yeah. And the lack of the lack of elders, the yeah. lack of people who've walked through that fire mm -hmm. before can be like, Hey, listen here, young buck. Like, let me, let me tell you about when I was there mm -hmm. and let me tell you about these lessons and then the respect for the elders. I think we've lost that. Oh, absolutely. There's a lot of like old people, but not elders uh, yeah. who can really like guide us through. And I think that's another, that is a beautiful thing about the internet culture that we have now is that people can find real elders that aren't in their family or aren't someone that they actually know who they can follow, who can talk about the lessons from the road and the lessons of the journey that people can assimilate that knowledge from. Yeah, I mean, your parents can relate to you to a certain extent, but at some point your life's gonna diverge from theirs and you need to look to other people that know more than, you know, like for example, you know, to use that football example again, if you suddenly became, you're the first in your family to ever have that kind of money, you can't look to your parents, you can't look to your grandparents right. for instruction on that. You need to find other people that have been there. And like you said, that is the beauty of the internet. And it is something that I do is lost in our culture. Um, not just fun, you know, financial means, but just in all this kind of spiritual stuff. Like if you're looking up towards these quote unquote anti, uh, alpha males who are saying that being vulnerable is, you know, means you're open for attack. You, you that's not the right person to even be looking up to. Right. Like you, they, and I think you need to take that stuff with a grain of salt too. Cause you have to look at these guys' lifestyles, the people that are saying this and be like, do you want that life? That life looks, it's usually always a guy who's been twice divorced and has a couple kids that he's paying child support for. And he feels like he's being very taken advantage of by the world. Um, you look at guys like that and go, no, I, why would I take advice from that guy? His life's horrible. Yeah. And I think about that a lot with just these people who become famous on social media and you look at their life and it's like you don't want you don't want that life like that life that's something that my buddy chris williamson horrible. talks about all the time is like horrible. you don't you don't get to pick and choose just one aspect of a person you have to take the whole thing and when elon musk was on joe rogan's podcast and he just looked straight at him and he's like you wouldn't want to be me and it was this really vulnerable moment of like you may think all of this is badass. I mean, he's basically like fucking Iron Man, mm -hmm. you know, just the amount that he's wielding right now in the world and the technology he's developing all of this. But his inner his inner world 
you know, for most of us to try and step into that, we would just fucking crack and break. Mm. And like the, the amount of tempering that he's had to go through to actually be able to hold and still even to this day, the discomfort that he kind of expressed that was under the surface of that simple line that he shared. It's true. You know, it's like, we don't have any idea what people are actually dealing with in their own private life. Robin Williams seemed like a happy motherfucker to me. Clearly see that not. With a lot of celebrities. You know, I had a buddy that uh, he's a trust fund kid, and he's the kind of you know individual that people want to hate on more than ever. It's someone who has you know daddy's money, and he told me one time we were we were drinking a couple of years ago, having a pretty honest conversation. He said he's similar thing as Elon. He's like you you wouldn't want my life. He's like my relationship with my dad is so strained, and I'm the only male in my family. And I'm the one that's, you know, tasked with carrying on the family name. And, you know, his childhood growing up was very much not what I would consider, you know, the childhood that I would have wanted to have. But it's part of, you know, stepping into this legacy that his his family had built. I remember him saying that to me. And at the time I was thinking, oh, what are you, what are you fucking crazy, man? Yeah. Like, of course I want your fucking <laughs> life. Like, it's, it seems pretty easy. Yeah. Um, but as I get older and I think about it, especially being a father now, I, I understand it. And I was like, damn, man, I would not want those wounds that I know he's still carrying. And I see yeah. the way his life is now and he's you know basically my same age and i see the way he's still living the way we talked about you know going out you know he goes to top golf and he's the one that buys all the bottle service and pays for everyone's good time and i see him still doing that in his mid-30s and i'm just like man that just you're just not you know he's not sure of himself he doesn't know who he is aside from the family name and i can see that in him and i feel for him yeah you know i was uh <clears throat> i'm and I think this will segue into talking about kids, which I know is something that, you know, you want to want to talk about. Oh, and yeah, something that's on, awesome. on my mind as well. But, you know, my dad was wealthy. You know, he was a commodities trader. He was written about in this book called Market Wizards, who's one of the early pioneers in commodities trading, which is buying and selling of So you say you want to be a wizard. Your dad actually was a wizard. <laughs> yeah, a wizard of, of the markets. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so he had, he had quite a bit of money. And so I had a lot of fucking beautiful blessings from that you know i didn't have to pay for my college hmm. you know i've worked in the summers at things that i wanted to do like i was a, a script reader for a production company and i would explore different things but be it wasn't fun. because i had to fucking earn you know it was like well I, I love writing let me do this or i love this let me do this you know so it was, it was about desire but not about like i had to so of course so many blessings from that and i don't ignore all those blessings but i'm really glad that there was never any trust there was never any amount of money that I got from him. I had to earn. As soon as I got out of college, I had to start earning. And he, there was just never anything that was ever there. And of course, there was the hypothetical when my father passed, of the hypothetical fucking you know, amount of money that I would get when I was whatever, 55 or 60 or whenever the fuck that was going to happen. But that's not enough to actually demotivate me. But I can imagine that if I had a trust... If he set up a trust where I had a bunch of money that I got when I was 30, you know, I started on it when I was 30 and really got going when I was 31. What if there was like a fucking $10 million trust? That you I wouldn't got have started I, it. Right? You would have. You or would've. I would have maybe started it, but I'm mean like, ah, fuck, didn't work. Not with the same tenacity. Not, not you, even close. You would have been biding time. You're like, I'm, right. basically, I'm basically just waiting until I'm 30. Uh, right. Like, you would have just been taking advantage of it could have derailed my whole fucking life uh -huh. if i would have had a trust it could have derailed my whole life so the fact that i didn't i'm so grateful for so now that i've come into my own wealth and, and actually my family didn't invest a penny in on it at all you know i got that from my buddy bodie That's miller awesome. and i got that from this other friend named howard and howard and bodie put in 110 grand took a chance on me and then we built on it from there and, and then obviously we sold it recently and so now i've come into my own money but i'm thinking about my kids and i think this really ultimately people talk about it create generational wealth it's like well what are you gonna do fuck up every generation <laughs> that comes you know comes after you because you have to be really really careful with that shit mm -hmm. and to me like i want to tell my kids from the start like i got you like when, if you ever you need something or you're in trouble or you have an idea that you need some support with or whatever, like we can talk about it. And if it's a solid fucking business plan, like I'll be there for you. And I got you all the way going through school while you're exploring and learning. But there is no trust and there is no inheritance. Like I want to end my life having given away every bit of money that I've earned to the places 
that need it the most. Like, and people are talking about setting things up so that you have this big like in, endowment or this big inheritance. I'm like, I don't think that's the right model. I think really the goal should be to accumulate as much as you desire to accumulate and then distribute that energy to, a, to make the world a better place and allow your kids to create their own energy. Like, I feel like that's, it's something that I want to make very clear from the start because I know how valuable it was for me not to have had that, you know, not to have had this easy way out. Because if you have the easy way out, it's tough. It's tough to not take it. Well, I think in a way, when you choose to leave behind a trust or inheritance, you're almost making your child's decisions for them after right. your death. It's a, it's a way of exerting control over their life path. Sure. And I can see it in my buddy. I don't think he'd be doing what he does for work if it wasn't the family business. Yep. It doesn't seem like it's something that really you know, interests him. Um, it's why people say, you know, your job as a parent is to give your kids opportunities you didn't have, but your job's not to decide their life for them. Yeah. And had your dad chosen to leave you behind a certain amount of money at an age, it would have essentially been deciding your life for you. Sure. I think the way that you're approaching it is the right way to do it. I think the one thing I'd want to leave behind, you know, for my posterity is like, you know, property kind of stuff. I, I, I yeah. like the idea of like having a family house. I that's agree. always been the family house. It's, it's, that's something that is the, that is the caveat to that, which would be, I would probably put, you know, we have a fucking unbelievable ranch in Sedona mm. and that and a, an unbelievable ranch. It's actually part of a nonprofit that's already in, in Lockhart, Texas mm -hmm. here, which is close. And I see these properties as properties that would never be sold. And I would probably actually put those in a trust so that they could never be sold, yeah. but that the family could always they'd be fully paid off. The trust would have enough to pay all the property taxes or whatever, but they would be in the family forever. And that's, that is something that, that is, that is the exception to what I'm saying. Cause there's certain things that it's are so cool. special. You know, it's like, and to know that I grew up in this place and had all my fucking crazy medicine journeys and spent all of this time and have all of these memories soaked in those walls and in this land. And I sweat in the sweat lodge and I fucking, you know, bled out there on the basketball court when I was giving hell to my mm -hmm. buddies and, and did all the things in this place and loved and laughed and like I do, would want that for my kids too. Essentially when you leave behind property, you're leaving behind memories. Yeah, and totally. You know, at my age, I would love if I had, like, if my great grandfather had a ranch somewhere I could still go visit. That, that would be so meaningful to me to be able to go stand in the place where I knew, like, generations before me stood. Um, you know, it's that Yellowstone model. I don't know if you watched that show. I didn't watch that show. That's, but a, I heard show, it was dope. that's a show that I got into. Like, you're into Game of Thrones. Like, I was pretty obsessed with Yellowstone. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, they leave behind the property to their their you know posterity, but they don't leave them money really because they still have to operate the ranch. They still have to run the cattle on the property, which is you know what Yellowstone's predicated on, and that is the right way to leave behind a legacy, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, and memories just, and all and the memories and knowledge you know, and love, love is love is the ultimate legacy. Absolutely, like, how much can you love? One of the things that really I've been realizing about kids, and you know, I'll be I'll be real honest here. There's a big part of my motivation in life was to be successful so that I could increase my ability to meet the fucking dream girl. Like mm. when I remember I had a moment, <laughs> I had a moment when I was, I, th I think I actually used a fake ID to get in there. I was in Vegas and there was this show called La Femme and it was like, uh, it was like the crazy horse show in Paris, but they brought the Paris show to the MGM Grand okay. and it was just, unbelievable unbelievably beautiful burlesque dancers and this like beautiful art and light topless dancing thing and i was there alone i was on like just a trip out there i don't know what maybe my family was doing something i don't know why the fuck i was there when i was like 19 or something like that had a fake id that i got from a i got from a stand here in texas that just oh, said wow. fake ids and i got so i got a louisiana id and uh and on the back of it, it said, not a real ID. Oh, wow. But but it looked like it was printed in the same way that you would print everything. It just all the text, instead of saying like the normal text that was on it, it said, not a real ID. So people would look at it, they'd turn it over, and it would literally say, not a real ID. And that's, I guess, how they did it legally. Yeah, well, so, yeah I was going to say that's so they can so legally sell it. So people would just like it. look at it and be like, all right. Because that like they would just not expect to see it. But anyways, I'm in the farm. I'm 19. And I'm looking at I'm looking at the women who are on stage, 
And I'm thinking to myself, and I was really frustrated as a lover at that point. Like I never was able to be with the the woman that I really liked. I would be like so, so obsessed and like writing poetry for some some you know girl that I was just like dreaming about being with. And it never worked out. And but I had some nice relationships, but it was always like while I was looking at somebody else, they would be looking at me and they'd be like, Oh yeah, okay, I guess we'll do this. It's in convenient. the meantime. In the meantime, you know, in the meantime You're we'll biding have, time. Like yeah. you had the trust fund yeah, was totally. where your eye was, but you're biding time totally. with the other ones. Totally. So in that moment, I just started getting tears in my eyes and I made this solemn vow. It was like, I will do whatever it takes in this world. And I so was sipping Crown Royal on ice and that was kind of my drink when I was younger. I had three older stepbrothers. So I was drinking whiskey from when I was 11. I managed to make it out all right. This is not a recommendation to do that. Uh, but anyways, I'm drinking, drinking my whiskey and I'm watching this. I was like, I'll do whatever I need to do to be as awesome a human in all, all categories from success to knowledge to humor to money to strength to whatever the things that make a man attractive i'm gonna be that so that i could ask one of these girls on a date and they would say yes <laughs> you know and it was like this solemn vow and some part of me was yes i want to offer and I also deeply wanted to impact the world i felt like i always had a message to offer the world that was important that was early early currents and it shifted a lot but those were some of the early sparks. So both of these things were in tandem, my desire to contribute to the world and my desire to make myself the type of man that could get the girl of my dreams, right? Both of those were intact. And actually through my polyamory journey, which was eight years and I had an amazing partner, Whitney, and we had a great relationship, but I was still polyamorous. So the, de the desire to find another beautiful woman that would like me was still a deep part of my motivation. Then I meet, Vailana, holy shit, she is the woman of my dreams. I fucking did it. I won. I won the game. That solemn vow that I made to myself, which was to be the most holistically awesome person so that when I found the, the woman of my dreams, she would want me, it worked in some way. And, and again, it was a holistic desire. I wasn't singularly focused on money or power. I was going to say, because there's two ways that can go. You have a lot of guys that have that motivation, but they do it with the sake of money and power. Like if I have this car, if I have this kind of house, right. if I have this kind of club, I'm going to meet these kind of women. Um, the way you approached it, I would say is the right way to approach it. Because you have a lot of people who, how do I attract this, this person in my life? Well, you become the person that is worthy of someone like that and worthy of someone like that yeah. honestly and if you're if you're attracting like you get what you're fishing with if you're fishing with money and you're fishing with these other lures like you're going to catch a fish that is attracted to that type of lure like i wanted them to be attracted to my essence hmm. that's the real type of it's relationship. a great way to look at things too because i always have this, this similar um outlook the men that try and attract women with money it's like why do you want that though like, is money all you have to offer? Right. You don't believe you have anything else. And so you'll see a lot of people lead with the one thing they feel they have to offer. And you'll see people that are very attractive and they won't develop any other character trait. They'll just focus on their looks. Yep. Do you want someone who only wants you for that one thing though? Because that one thing is likely not, it's not always going to be there. Right. Like there's a risk you could lose that one thing. And you're not going to attract what you actually want you know, which is someone who loves you for you. And allows you to be you and allows you to grow. And, you know, you don't feel that you have to put on a front for them. Yeah. And you don't feel like you have to, you know, I, I think that you're talking about people with power. I, I see this being an issue. If, if you were someone who's really famous and you were like a musician, for example, and you attracted someone because you were in a band, um, where are you 10 years from now when you're no longer touring though? And you're no yeah. longer that musician. Like, do they still want to be with you or are they just attracted to the musician, the lead guitar player and the lifestyle kind of thing? Yeah. And I can see why someone in that kind of limelight would have a very hard time trusting people. For sure. You know, and I think the, it's also, you have to be aware of the other side of that, the shadow of that, which is, I just want someone to love me as I am. So I'm just going to sit around and play fucking video games and not read books, and not go to the gym because yeah, yeah. I want them just to love me as I am. Well, be better. Like it's okay to be better. <laughs> you know what like I mean? Like you want someone just as slovenly as you? Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, are you attracted to yourself? You want someone that's exactly <laughs> like you right uh -huh. now. Chances are you don't. Right. The people that are like that are probably still looking towards these people like you are. They're looking towards these 
these women or men that are, you know, powerful, status, uh, attractive, artistic, and they're thinking, I want someone like that, but I want them to love me for who I am. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's not going to happen, man. Because yeah. who you are is kind of a piece of shit right now. <laughs> yep. So, all right. So I'm bringing this all the way back around to kids. So fundamentally, okay, I meet my, I meet my dream woman. I'm so fucking happy in this marriage. It's unbelievable. I love her so much. It seems much. that way. I like I to see it. I love her so much. She's amazing. Yeah, I like seeing the way you champion her. It's cool. Oh, she's the fucking best. It's so easy. And I get emotional just thinking about it because literally, like, this is my dream. And I, I fucking got it more than anything else. This was like one of the deepest desires of my life. And here I am. And it's, and it's fucking there. And it's amazing. And it's, it's better than I ever could have imagined. And sure, it has its challenges, and it's not all polyamorous. Every relationship does fairy though. tale fantasy. It has its own difficulties, of course. But like, I got, I got there. And so, one of the challenges now that I'm there, this big thing that's been motivating me my whole life, which is to be awesome, so that women will like me. I'm like, well, fuck. I've got the, I got the woman of my dreams, and she really loves the deepness of my core essence. And so the desire to be awesome, I can't motivate my myself the same way. So I still have the desire to help the world, but also I'm doing a lot for the world and also you know, the people who I love are, are well taken care of. So it gets me starting to think about, so there's sometimes like a crisis of me really caring. Like I'll be like, man, I really, I, I really have this idea to produce this thing or create this thing. And, and I'm kind of forcing myself to do it out of my own like diligence and dedication. And, and it, but it's, it's a push rather than a pull, getting pulled by mm. this motivation. But then I think about having a kid and I know like, uh, I, I bet, I bet the next thing, the next thing that'll give me that extra bit of motivation, that extra bit of I fucking care even more is when I see my kid and I think, oh shit. I got to really, I got to make a world a better place for my son and for my daughter. You know, I feel like in that moment, it will be a whole new paradigm that I'll step into where I'm going to care in the same way I used to care, you know, but just for a different reason. What you're going to find too, and what you're saying is exactly what happened for me. Um, what I found and what I believe you're going to find is too, when you when you become a father, you think, if I were to die, what would my kids remember me by? And it almost forces you to step up and be a very courageous individual and to be someone that your son or daughter would be proud to say mm -hmm. that was my dad. And that's one of the things that motivated me, not so much changing the world, but just being a man of character. Yeah. Um, cause you don't know how many years you're going to have with them to really imprint memories of yourself. And I would like my son, whenever I do pass, you know, hopefully before him, uh, to be proud of me and be like, yeah. that was my dad. Yeah. And it's made decisions easier for me. It's made, it's made it very, it's simplified a lot of complex issues in my life. Um, cause I no longer am as concerned with how other people perceive me as long as my child perceives me a certain way. Mm -hmm. And the analogy I use for this is, I used to be someone who hated when people brought kids to a nice restaurant. <laughs> I, I couldn't stand it. Yeah. I was like, what the fuck are you doing? Especially when I lived in New York City. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But now I look at those people and I'm like, fuck yeah. Like that's a person who truly doesn't care because they know all of you <laughs> are going to be upset with them. Yeah. But what they want to do is they want to have a nice meal with their kid and perhaps they want their kid to try this dish here that makes the best, you know, key lime pie there is. They want that kid to experience that and they're here to give them that and they don't give a fuck what any of you think about it. Mm -hmm. And so I tell people, I say, you want to know someone who truly doesn't give a fuck? It's someone bringing a kid to a five-star restaurant. <laughs> and yeah. And so I, I'm like that now. Like I take my kid, I was down on Rainy Street yesterday with my son, walked into a bar with him because I wanted some barbecue food from that bar. And like, I don't care if you don't want a kid in your bar. Like, I'm walking in with him. He's fine. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to yeah, hold yeah. him the whole time. Yeah. Um, and it's just made me so much more carefree as an individual because your whole purpose is trying to give them memories and show them life. And from a writer's perspective, um, the book I'm working on now is a similar idea. I told myself, you know, 
if if I were to die, what would my son remember me by? I was like, I need, I feel the need to write a memoir. Uh, I used to think that writing a memoir before the age of fifty was very like self. Uh, it, it was yeah, self indulgent. It was like, who who the fuck are you to write a memoir under fifty? Like you haven't lived, you haven't sailed the world on a ship. Like you're not someone to talk about <laughs> it. Yeah. Um, but now I'm like, man, I just want to write one because I do feel like people can relate to my story. I've had a lot of good feedback from when I have talked about it on various podcasts. But also, I just want to write it so if something happens, my son could read it and be like, get a pretty good grasp of who his dad was. Yeah, yeah, that's that's beautiful to think about. I also think about too. There's lots of little aspects of myself that I know I want to change, but you know, I can get by <laughs> without changing them. But if I have a, a child that I know that I'm going to imprint those characteristics, uh -huh. like so many of my dad's neuroses, he didn't try to pass them on to me. He didn't teach me his neuroses. Mm -hmm. I just got them fear of like, the, he had an intense fear of getting like, sinus colds and just regular things like that it was like he was so stressed about it and that passed on to me <laughs> you know like i fucking get so like if i start to feel a tickle in my nose i'm like oh god here it comes it, these little things that i've struggled with my whole life to a certain not huge things the big things i've tackled like you know he would f fly into fits of rage sometimes and repress things repress things till they bottled up and then explode and those things i had to work through earlier and i put my diligence in because that affected the people that I was in partnership with. It affected a lot of people mm -hmm. and it affected employees. I remember, you know, I got, I lost my temper with an employee one time and then it was just an awful situation. I was like, fucking never again. Like you're never going to do that again. And so I've worked on the big stuff that passed, but so much of the little stuff I've just kind of put off, but I don't want, I don't want to, you know, have my child pick up on all of these little things that I've been too lazy to actually fix within myself because it's not that big a deal when it's only me because I can withstand it, my own little neurotic anxieties and my own little bullshit. But when I have a kid that's learning from me, not by what I'm teaching them, but by what they're sensing and feeling, fuck yeah, all right, let's go. Like it's time to really fully heal all of this so that they have a chance Sure, they can develop their own neuroses, but they're not going to get them from me. You know what it's, I mean? Uh, I think Jordan Peterson recently said, uh, it's almost impossible to mature until you become a parent. Mm -hmm. And I would have been someone to disagree with that wholeheartedly years ago. But once you become a parent, you're like exactly what you're saying. It's You no longer have the excuse to ignore the little things about yourself that you know you should fix. Um, and my son's only 13 months now, but he'll pick up on things like tonality. Um, he'll like, you know, he, he can't, you know, produce a bunch of words yet, but he'll mimic back noises to you in a tone that was very similar to the way I just said yeah, something. Yeah. And, you know, if I, if I lose my temper and I'm frustrated for a bit, I can see in his face that he's scared of me at that moment. Sure. Even if like, if I'm on a phone call or if I'm, you know, talking to someone and my son just happens to be witnessing it, it's a hard thing to see because you realize that even though he's young, he's picking up your energy. He's picking up your tone and he's starting to learn how to process things already. He's starting to, you know, parrot stuff back to you. And it's like they say, you know, your 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 children are a reflection of you. Like they mm. mirror back all the bad behaviors you have. And the good ones. And the good ones. And that's what I've really enjoyed about writing a book during this period of having my son as young as he is, is it's forcing me to, like we talked about earlier, reparent myself. But as I go back and think, when did I pick up this ha habit? what caused me to have this habit is it something i i could have avoided and it's just been so interesting to look at my past in a way i never would have approached if i hadn't become a dad yeah and it's so honestly if you're someone who enjoys learning which i know you are it's fun yeah. it's painful but it's fun I like because you feel like every day you're progressing uh, you don't get in that rut feeling of every day being the same if you look at it from a different perspective. Um, it's been so fucking enjoyable. And before, I remember when I first found out I was going to be a dad, uh, I wasn't ready. And I was a horrible partner to my girlfriend for probably the first couple of weeks because um, I was so paranoid that it was going to 
strip away any bit of my life I enjoyed. And I started drinking really heavily again. And I hadn't drank, you know, much up to that point. I'd kind of stopped and was kind of over it. Started drinking heavily again. And I just had the hardest time coming to terms with the fact I was going to be a father. And a lot of it came from, I realized I was surrounding myself with the wrong people. Mm -hmm. Because when I announced that I was going to be a dad and it got out, most of the messages I received from men were the messages along the lines of, oh shit, your life is over. Oh, what are you going to do now? Mm. Just the very negative, even from other fathers. Like I had people who were dads say that to me and I'm just thinking, whoa. And I was at a point of just being so emotionally vulnerable because I was struggling with it that I internalized that. And it made me terrible. Yeah. And it wasn't until I had a talk with an old acquaintance of mine and he has five kids and he told me he said kyle being a dad's the best thing that ever happened to me because it made me more motivated it's maybe more successful it's made me just try harder in life it's given me a whole new motivation care yeah and it's more. and he was someone who's very financially successful he had a, a fun lifestyle and he told me that and it just kind of jostled something loose in my head because he was the first Unfortunately, he was the, beside, aside from my dad and my brothers, like immediate family members, he was the first male in my life who said something positive to me about it. And then I remember thinking, man, every single person that has given me negative feedback lives a lifestyle that I think is fucking awful. Like I can't think of one person that I want to emulate their life. Why am I internalizing any of that? Yeah. Like their life is terrible. Like my life's going to be what I want to make it. My my parenthood journey is going to be what I want to make it. And it completely flipped it on its head. And the next day I woke up and I was just stoked. I was ready to be a dad. I was like, oh, it's going to be so awesome. I'm going to get so much inspiration. I'm going to learn so much about myself. I'm going to have a bond that otherwise I'll never have. And it just completely filled my life with joy. And even to this day, like I have I'm remorseful when I think of to how I was the first month when I see him smile or laugh. And it's just one of those things that I'm, I'm happy to talk about, even though it's shameful because I know I'm not the only man that's felt that way or is sure. going to feel that way. And I'm pretty fervent in mentioning it because I want other people if they do ever get filled with that doubt to know that it's just complete bullshit. Mm. Um, I had someone else say to me, well, it, it was like a joke. Someone said, uh, I don't want to have kids because I want to fly business class. And I told them, I said, my buddy has five kids and just bought his second jet. <laughs> so it really is a difference of just perspective. Yeah, Like there's absolutely nothing kids are going to hold you back from. Um, I love it. And I'm stoked for you to become a dad. It's funny because I actually remember listening to some of your older podcasts six months ago when I started kind of digging into your your uh, back catalog. And I remember thinking, I wonder if this guy's going to have a, have kids. Mm -hmm. Is this going to be, is this the kind of dude who doesn't want to have kids? Because I feel like he's the kind of person that should have kids. <laughs> and when sure. I heard you talk about in a recent episode, you were going to start trying. I was like, fuck yeah. yeah. Fuck yeah. Like this is someone who should have a kid. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, for current dads who are listening, I think one of the things that I think is the most powerful, even if you can't change yourself right now, if you can bring awareness to what you're doing, and I think kids are always smarter than you think they are. And like you bring awareness to what you're doing and you own, you know, your own neuroses and you own your own shit. Like, hey, you see how I talk to mom there? Well, this is a really bad habit that mm -hmm. dad has, you know, and I picked up this habit from my dad and I get this feeling and it comes up and then I stop thinking clearly and I start, you know, imagining that mom did something when really she didn't because I'm not seeing from her perspective. And then later, like right now, I recognize what I did and then I go apologize to mom for it, you know, and you like walk them through mm. like the actual inner intricacies of what's happening. Like, that's i think the necessary first step it'll help you change first of all but also that brings the child on the inside of the experience and so they actually get to learn from you directly even though some of the imprinting may still happen it'll mitigate so much of the the subconscious patterning that's happening because you're going to create a pattern interrupt where you explain what happened and they'll understand the world they'll understand the fallibility of being a human they'll understand so many things and 
even though I'm not a parent yet, I just, I know that from all my sisters and all the people and my own, you know, being a child myself, like if I could just have understood everything a little bit better and really gotten it and like really been able to be on the inside, I think that's the, that's the first most important step. I would agree. And I think you and Aaron talked about it when you said, you know, learning out loud. It's, yeah. the, it's that ability to own up to your mistakes and admit that you're still human yourself. And it's probably the best thing you can pass on to any child is just not having shame or guilt when you make mistakes. Like yeah. that happens. Like you own them and you learn from it and it's okay to talk about it. And that's something that I, whether it was intentional or not, I, I, I can imagine it was not intentional. I didn't have a lot of that growing up because of the religious aspect. Yeah. Because it seemed like the answer to everything was scripture or prayer and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I just do not want my child to feel in any way, shape, or form. Like, I don't want him to feel like there's someone looming over him, judging him for everything he does. Like, I remember, like, a super stupid story, but I remember, uh, I remember when I was like 14 or 15, I remember thinking, uh, the reason I couldn't get a girlfriend is because I looked at porn. <laughs> and I thought, I thought that God had seen me looking at porn and was like punishing me for looking at porn. And at that age in my life, I didn't have enough to really kind of pull back from and realize that was a bullshit belief. Yeah. But like that kind of shame and guilt and feeling like something's always judging you is just, it's awful. No, it's awful. not the way. Well, Kyle, let's do this again when I have kids, man. Absolutely. Be fun. I want to, I want to come back and I'd have that to. conversation with yeah. you and, uh, it's been a real, ple a real pleasure, yeah, brother. Thanks for having me on. It's been Absolutely. a good time. Absolutely. You got a bunch of books. You got a new one coming out, right? Uh, new one's like, that's the newest one. Speech therapy Speech is therapy? the newest one. I have one What's in the, the book signing for? Is it, is it for book this signing one? is actually for my older books called Fucking History. <laughs> and it's, uh, cool. it's like a humorous approach on a bunch of historical stuff that people might not have known. So yeah. I'll actually be doing the book signing tomorrow for that one because that one went through a major publisher and the publishers are the ones that set all that up. Yeah. Dope, man. Well, this is awesome. Um, follow you where? Where can people find more of your stuff? And yeah, if you go on Instagram or Twitter, SGRSDK, or just type the cat, then you should find it. Yeah. Right on, brother. Thanks for coming on and much Thank love, you. everybody. Peace. Thanks for tuning into this video. Make sure you hit subscribe. Follow me at Aubrey Marcus. Check out the Aubrey Marcus podcast available everywhere and leave a comment. Let me know if this video resonated or what else you would like to hear from me in the future. Thank you so much.